Can I? <laughs> I see it. It's recording. Okay, we can get started to get on our Facebook Live for tonight, tonight's Monday Mojo. And let me just connect on my phone as well. And okay, so <clears throat> as we're signing in and we're going live, um, I'm just gonna get my phone out and see who's joining in and who's gonna see, who's gonna be signing in with us this 8.30 p.m. Uh, Monday Mojo um, for Change School TV. Great, so hi guys. Um, welcome to another episode of our Change School TV. Um, we're at episode 46 and I'm really excited about tonight's session. Um, you know, we're always sharing humans of change and stories of change within our community across the globe. And tonight's story is from a beautiful woman called Ramya Raghupathy. Sorry, I'm terrible <laughs> at surnames and I did mention this earlier when I started. So let's just say it again. Um, her name is Ramya Raghupathy. And um, I hope I got it right. Perfect. Okay, great. So, hey, Daryl, um, as always, I'm going to be on my phone. I'm going to be seeing who of you guys are watching us live. Um, you know, Monday evenings, it's really sometimes our mojo is a little bit low, and these sessions are really to inspire us, to motivate us, to really get out of that Monday blues and get the week started off right. Um, so I'm back for all of this month and, you know, um, last month Salonia had the pleasure of interviewing and speaking to all of our humans of change. And this month I have the pleasure and, um, you know, as I have sessions before each of our lives with the speakers, it's always great to get to know a little bit more about them and hear their stories. And, um, you know, tonight we're definitely going to share something that I think is going to be inspiring to many of you, whether you're in Singapore or globally um, around the story of change and trial and error and you know figuring out your direction or whether you need to have a set direction straight away. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna introduce you to our speaker this evening. And our topic is around the road to goodness. And um, Ramya, you can probably share a little bit more about that as we talk to tonight's conversation. But I wanna ask you first, um, you know, how did you start or could you share more on your career and your experience because you've had quite a colorful experience with regards to your career um so you're not the first one to say it's colorful well first of all hello everyone <laughs> how rude of me <laughs> um yeah so you're not the first one to say it's colorful um i've actually sat in a job interview once and and the interviewer was like I don't understand <laughs> your trajectory. And it's interesting because I see the trajectory really, really clearly. Um, you know, the old adage, um, you know, everything in your life has set you up for today and, you know, everything that's happening today is setting you up for tomorrow. And I think that's extremely applicable to my life. I fell into my first job quite accidentally. I was one of those who graduated with no clue uh, of what I wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes it's the most random unexpected people who give you direction. And the career services per, uh, person of the uh, program I was in at university, um, at uh, National University of Singapore, there's a program called University Scholars Program, Clueless, and she came up to me and she said, um, you know what you'd be really good for, Ramya? And I was like, what? <laughs> and she said, um, public relations. And, you know, I should have been really overjoyed that I, I had an answer, but immediately I was like, I don't really know what that is. And the only reference point I had was Samantha Jones from Sex and the City, which didn't oh. the best impression. Um, but then I, I decided to give that a shot. Um, at the same time, I had a professor, I did political science honors, and my professor at the end of the year basically sat me down and said, promise me one thing. And I said, what? <laughs> he said, promise me you will never join the government's office. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, all my classmates were doing that, so it felt like the natural thing to do. But um, based on these two pieces of fantastic advice that I'm grateful for even today, um, I went in the direction of public relations, uh, fell into my first role, joined as an intern, and within three months got confirmed, was given a full-time role. So I started out as a public relations consultant that way and then you know, grew in that role, 
grew as a leader in that position as well, you know, helped to grow the business. And then I moved on to another consultancy where I went from pure public relations to um, more 360 degrees marketing. And then from there, my former boss basically poached me <laughs> into my first in-house corporate role. And I think that's the role where I really, really grew as a person and a professional. I had the best bosses and I think I've been very blessed that way. I've had bosses who have taught me and taught me well. I learned a lot about corporate navigation, organizational behavior, reading between the lines, less is more, you know, all these things yeah. that we really take for granted because very often we're very consumed by technical skills, the need for technical skills. Yeah. And we forget about all these soft skills. I mean, I hate terms like that, but we forget about these skills that are really transferable across jobs, industry sectors. It doesn't matter, you know, but when you enter an organization, you know how to carry yourself, you know how to navigate, you know how to pitch an idea. These are really the things that carry you forward. And in my role today, I'm using every single thing I learned in the first eight years, eight to 10 years of my career. And then I went off um, to do my MBA, um, you know, a decision my parents still don't understand. Because, you know, I had a great job. I had a cushy job, right? And they don't understand why I would leave it, especially when I told them I'm leaving it because I'm, I'm on the right track, you know, like I know exactly where I'm going to be 10, 20 years from now. And to them, that was great, but they come from a different generation. Yeah. For me, I just thought I didn't want my life planned out for me at 32. It just felt too soon. And I wanted to know what else was out there. And so I, I realized that the time was now or never. You get out now, see what else is out there because I'd been in the industry long enough to know that I could always come back. So I had a safety net. So key takeaway number one, have yeah. a thought of safety net. Uh, so I knew I could come back and you know and, and Singapore is always a great market for that uh, that sort of buoy job market buoyancy that we have um, so yeah left went off to do the MBA and also I think I got a lot uh, pretty disillusioned with the corporate world you know I worked for an organization where a bad year was making 50 billion euros instead of 55 billion euros and people would get fired the business would get restructured and I just wasn't sure this was for me and I'd always wanted to be in the social impact space. So, you know, while I had my main job, I always did volunteer work. And I thought, you know, I want to make my volunteer work my main job. Yeah. So I knew that after the MBA, I wanted to move into the social impact space. Um, and I sort of managed to do that. I was in Europe for a while. I did business development for an impact fund. But then, you know, things got very tricky with visas and all of that because I was very clear of what I wanted. Um, yeah. Organizations I could work for were pretty uh, nascent. And so they weren't in a position to issue visas. It cost a lot of money. These were startups. Um, so that was sort of like something that was happening on one sort of plane. And in parallel, um, just before going off to business school, I found out I couldn't eat wheat or dairy. Um, right. I was losing a lot of my hair. It was a combination of stress, but mostly diet. And I was already on a journey of wellness before that, you know, doing detoxes, taking care of myself, you know, understanding this idea of you are what you eat. Yes. So when I went away uh, for school, I completely overhauled my diet. Um, but then again, I was also someone who had been baking since I was 16. And the worst thing to tell a baker is that she can't eat wheat. <laughs> you know, like, okay, what am I going to bake now? Right. So, uh, so I had some time, I suppose, while I was at school and I started sort of reinventing and overhauling the repertoire. And I came home for a visit to Singapore once and people were like, oh my God, you got to sell this here. And I was like, no, no, I'll never be an entrepreneur. Takeaway number two, <laughs> never say never. <laughs> I honestly never, ever, ever imagined I would work for myself, be an entrepreneur. I always thought I, I had no discipline. I needed to work for someone. I needed routine. I needed structure. Um, so that was sort of the parallel track. Yeah. And then when the whole visa thing was going nuts, I thought, you know what? I need to feel ground under my feet. Um, oh, and before that, actually, I forgot this important part. Uh, in December 2015, over the holiday season, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make these things and I'm going to sell them and see what happens. And you know, over the holiday season, I made enough money to buy my first professional sort of industrial oven. Amazing. Uh, but then I had to go back to London. So I sort of parked that. And so when the whole visa mess happened, I was like, hmm. I kind of have something I could go back to, you know, it, it gets harder to make that sort of shift or take that sort of leap when you're much older. I didn't have crazy commitments. Um, shall I just go home and feel ground beneath my feet for a while, you know, where I didn't have to worry about visas, employment and stuff. So I did. And I came home in April, 2016, but I didn't move my stuff because I still wasn't <laughs> sure. I kept my stuff in London 
And by October, I knew it was the right thing to do. I discovered a whole sense of like a whole different side of me. And I think that's a very important thing about entrepreneurship, the self-discovery part. Um, you know, I always thought I was a very self-aware, centered person. But then entrepreneurship has just unveiled so much. I did not know um, things that cause you anxiety, things that you didn't even know you loved. Um, you know, um, starting the company allowed me to be my crazy creative self. If you knew I had to laugh. <laughs> It's almost like I was high or drunk, you know, <laughs> like, no, that's not the case. <laughs> when you look at the names, you're like, how did she come up with these names? Long story, different interview. Um, and at the same time, I got to be my OCD Excel spreadsheet financial model self, which I really liked as well. And I, I, and I really enjoyed it. And I realized how much joy I found in creating, building, fixing um, things I didn't really know. I mean, I kind of enjoy it, but not on such a conscious level. Yeah. And I was very conscious of the things that I really enjoyed. And, um, and remember I said that everything I'd done before set me up for this. Yes. So the first thing I outsourced, logistics. <laughs> when you work for logistics, for the logistics industry for eight years, you know what a pain it is. So outsource that. And the second thing I, I did was find someone to do the actual baking. Um, right. So that I could focus on the business development and the finance and the marketing, um, which are really the things that brought me joy. Of course, my mother doesn't believe this and she thinks I went off to do an MBA and now I bake every single day. I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> it's kind of technically true. Well, not really. I mean, I haven't baked, baked in two years, but um, I mean, the company's now two and a half, right? Um, so that's the funny thing. I think she worries about me every day. And here we are, you know, I now have a team of about six people, um, really great people. Um, and I took the whole wanting to be in social impact thing, uh, or rather I brought it back to Singapore. What started out as a passion project in December, 2015, eventually grew into a business. And uh, when I was ready, I incorporated it. I mean, I did not, I was not in a rush to incorporate it um, yeah. because there are certain pros and cons to that. And I knew that incorporating it too soon would mean that um, I couldn't benefit from certain uh, programs or grants that uh, uh, new uh, entities could benefit from. So I took my time and when I was ready, then I went from a sole proprietorship to, an incorpor uh, to incorporating. And yeah, so here we are and I'm loving it. I mean, when I'm not exhausted <laughs> and when I'm not, you know, feeling completely anxious about a variety of things. It's a good thing this interview is not happening in the last week of the month. <laughs> I'm like, salaries and rent, salaries and rent. Um, but yeah, pretty so good. It'd be great. I mean, you know, it'd be great to share a little bit more on your company. I love the name, first of all. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, it's bloody brilliant. Um, you know, so um, I'd love to know, one, just how you started, you know, with regards to um, the name. And two is, you know, what does it turn into? When you first started to where it is now, how has that sort of evolved? Well, you know, it, you, you kind of forget because it all seems so long yeah. ago. <laughs> years ago. Um, I want this was pretty random, but I don't think it really was. Um, I guess I, I knew what the product was going to be and I knew exactly what was in the product so I mean for, for, for the audience uh, for the audience sake we, we manufacture gluten-free dairy-free refined sugar-free um, something we call the oh my goodness trinity uh, baked goods it started off with cakes now we do cakes breads and cookies and then eventually we're going to move into wraps pizza bases and uh, the whole idea is um, to you know if you're a gluten-free, dairy-free household three years from now, you should be able to get everything from us for your dining table and not just, you know, the, the treats. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit of background. Um, I guess it just popped into my head one day. I can't explain it. And on, on the 12th of December, 2015, I was tossing and turning in bed. I had a logo in my mind. I knew it was going to be called, oh my goodness, to play on the word goodness. And I am marketing and PR trained, right? So I guess, you know, I wanted to be something catchy. I never wanted to associate myself with it because I wanted my personal brand to be different from the company and grow a brand on its own. Yeah. Um, so I never called it Ramya's Bakery. A lot of people asked me that. And I was like, no, you know, I wanted to have a life of its own because I want to be kept separate from it. And for yeah. me, that was a very important part of the journey because I think, you know, very often we think the company is the person, the person is the company, but, and, and that adds to a lot of stress and anxiety sometimes, because when the company makes mistakes, you, you put it on yourself, you know, and, um, and um, 
I just wanted the two to be really separate. So I thought, hey, oh my goodness. Uh, I thought I wanted the company to be sort of, um, I mean, our brand identity is quirky, but sophisticated. So you see uh, black and gold, but it's also like shimmery and bling and you have the exclamation mark. Um, you know, it was really just that. I mean, it was so many different things coming together and I, I had the logo in my, my mind and I basically thought, you know, you could keep tossing and turning or you could get out of bed and design this. So I did that. I, I remember around 11 in the morning, I was at my computer. I hadn't even gotten off my PJs yet. And <laughs> designed it, set up the Facebook page. Later on, had a had an e-commerce platform. And that was it, you know. Um, but the part that's really important that I haven't mentioned is that that was Saturday. Thursday night, I went for a networking event and I bumped into a former CEO from the last job that I had. And we had always had a great connection. And he was like, hey, you know, what, what are you doing now? You, I know you went off to school. And I told him about the difficult journey I would had with, you know, uh, moving to Europe and, and the visas and all of that. And somehow our conversation just inspired me. Like, and I finally had the chance to tell him that last year. And I'm very happy about that. But, you know, he was saying things to me like, you know, because I was like, oh, you know, I've cried a lot this year. <laughs> and you know, well, if you didn't cry, you didn't want it uh, hard enough. Um, uh, you didn't want it enough. And I said, well, yeah, but I think I've made some mistakes. And he said, um, if you didn't make mistakes, you didn't try hard enough. Yeah. And somehow this conversation just sort of led to me going, I think I just have to give this a shot, you know, because a lot of people were telling me to sell this, start the business, but I was like, no, no, no. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it, it just happened quite by accident. But at the same time, and you know, I, I work with a lot of um, younger students and I mentor them and yes. very often I hear people say, when I grow up, I want to be an entrepreneur. And I don't mean to be a buzzkill, but I'm often like, I'm not sure that's how it works. Yeah. You know, um, you kind of need to have a problem. Yeah. And you kind of need, this problem I feel needs to really resonate with you and it needs to be personal and you need to have a vested interest, interest in it. And I think that's where some of the best ideas come from. And if you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs, and I in no way regard myself as a successful entrepreneur, not yet. Um, <laughs> you know, I, the more podcasts friends send to me and stuff, you realize a lot of people kind of fell into entre entrepreneurship very often because they were trying to solve their own problem. And in my case, you know, I found that I didn't have any good food to eat in Singapore. You know, I had to avoid wheat and dairy. And I'm like, it's nothing to eat. So I'm just going to make it myself. You know? That's so true. I mean, I think that's something that we hear all the time. And I know for myself, you know, in my own journey, I just always fell into what it is that I ended up doing because there were problems that I was facing or that I saw, you know, perhaps a company I was working with was having, right? And so yeah, exactly. a lot of the times, you know, whether it's our work through coaching or other other means, one of the things is like, okay, if someone's really like, I want to just start a business, but you're looking for ideas everywhere, um, sometimes it, it's just it doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're feeling a certain need or feeling that there is a certain area that you wish there were more opportunities for, or, um, you know, yeah, whether it's the wellness or for me, you know, the, the change goal for Soul and I really started from our own need of not having, we didn't want to do an MBA and we didn't want to go on a yoga retreat, right? So it was <laughs> a combination of the two and that's how we started with retreats, right? And then from there, it sort of evolved as we started to take it to, to another level. And I think that point is so relevant, especially when people are looking at career change, right? Yeah. Or life changes. It's really about looking at adjacent possibilities and really being able to understand as well that self-awareness and that self-discovery and think about mm -hmm. what are those areas that are niggling in you that are making you want to make a change somehow big or small. Yeah. And I think, you know, just to extend on that, it also helps, especially if you do end up, in, you know, taking that road down towards entrepreneurship, that first-hand experience that you had that drove you to develop that idea in the first place really helps you understand your customers, right? And I find that, at least for our business, that's really made a difference for us. You know, when we started out, we did a lot of events. People would stop at our booth and they would talk to us. And I would often be the one sort of engaging with them and understanding what they were looking for, what they needed, just hearing them out. And it was always such an interesting, engaging conversation because I knew exactly what they were talking about. And there's that bond that you form with your first few customers because 
you you really get that validation for the idea and you know if you go through like some sort of incubator accelerator these are all the buzzwords right market yeah. validation you know traction testing prototyping we kind of did it all in a different order and then when we went to events and we met customers we got that validation that we needed and more importantly we got more feedback that we could then put into the business to develop more products Absolutely. you know and i think that's very important listening to your customers whether they are b2b customers or b2c customers with B2C, we understood what were some of the things people were craving. And I said, yeah, me too, you know, and with B2C, B2B customers, it's sort of like, what are their cost models? You know, how do you fit into that? How do you price? How do you pack, you know, in a way that really works for them? And when, when you're really involved and when you're really trying to go in with the mindset of providing a service, you're really able to listen better um, yep. because in the end, you're just trying to find a way to provide a service and not get into, and, and not like go in with the idea of like, I want to, I want to make it really rich tomorrow, you know? Yep. And at the beginning I met, when I started talking to investors sort of very loosely at the very early stages, I, I was very confused. I remember because some of them would be, so what's your exit strategy? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I just entered. <laughs> I don't know. And it's interesting how different people give you very different advice. Like uh, some of the VC people were like, well, if you don't have an exit strategy, then, you know, don't even do this at all. Oh uh, yeah. But, but I'm here to provide a service to customers and I'll exit when I feel I'm done. I don't need to go in looking at the door, you know? Um, so that actually leads me to something else. I think we talked about and, you know, I wanted to touch on today, which is, the people you surround yourself with yes. when you're making this change. And, you know, at the beginning, I was a sponge and I highly recommend being a sponge, <laughs> you know, meet as many people as you can, especially at the beginning. After a while, you learn to prioritize, you learn to filter. But I was just talking to so many different people. And it, it sounds crazy when I say it's great to hear so many conflicting views, but I think that really helps you shape yourself. You know, um, what works for you and what doesn't. And, you know, last year we started our first sort of round of fundraising and, you know, six conversations later, I realized this investor tried to actually turn us into a customer. And I was like, which part of my pitch deck said I had money to spend? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Looking for money to, to spend for ourselves and not for you. Anyway, that aside. But that's so true. I mean, I think a lot of the times, you know, it's so easy to get bombarded. And we've been there too, right? Where your what you start out obviously morphs into different or in different ways, right? And as yes. you get involved in the business and as you start building the business, but you know, everyone is so quick to give advice. Um, and everyone is so quick to want to just really be able to start saying this is how you should do things or this is what works or doesn't work. And I mean, I guess for our business, the thing is, is we're such a, uh, we're a slightly different type of business than a traditional startup. Um, so sometimes the advice that we've had or that we've been given isn't always necessarily relevant to what it is that we're building. Um, so I think, you know, like you said, be a sponge at the start, which is so true, but just also be mindful that people are so quick to give advice and to try and really just take the advice that resonates with you. Also, obviously challenging yourself and making sure that you're constantly growing and developing yourself from there. Um, so I think, you know, uh, all of those points are extremely relevant and extremely important, and I couldn't I couldn't agree more with what you've just shared there. Um, and I think something else that I also want to share is that, you know, of course, um, as you're talking about uh, entrepreneurship, it's we learn so much, right? And I think you were talking about how self discovery is so important for myself and and Salonia. I know that we've learned so much about ourselves. We've learned so much about each other, all of these sort of things as we've sort of gone on to it. Um, so, oops, I think we've had some technical difficulties here. Um, I might have just lost Ramya. Oh, no, you're back. Hi. Okay, so I'm just seeing you here. We had some difficulties. Um, I think I just got you back. Hello. Hello. Sorry about that. <laughs> Little technical glitch there. Sorry, I had that. I, was, I just had that not long ago. I was um, speaking on someone's masterclass and my computer plug died. So I had to shift 
halfway through um, to the other side of the table. But we, I was just saying, and as you were talking about, you know, entrepreneurship, I think one of the things that you talked about is that whole self-discovery process. And, you know, as you're speaking to people, as you're getting more advice, you also start to learn more about what resonates with you, what what type of people or what type of investors or what type of peer counsel you want Absolutely. to represent as well, right? You become stronger, um, sometimes more stubborn, but you usually become stronger in, in, in validating what it is you want yourself. Well, I think in, in, in my case, my personal journey, oh, I hope you like the new view. I had to move. <laughs> That's why um, life is awesome, right? You get exactly. It's, it's how it is right now. I did this for the audience. <laughs> I thought they needed a change in view. Um, I think in my case, you know, it's, I'm, I'm a very sensitive person as well. And I think that was part of the discovery, the personal journey. Um, um, the, the, conversations um, I had with some investors, you know, yes, it makes you stronger. But for me, it sort of took me into a bad place first because right. you get really confused. Oh, yeah. And if you don't process that confusion and, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you kind of like go, 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 go. And very often you don't take enough time to just sit down and stand into space. I highly recommend that. Yeah. Um, and you're just chasing and because you think, you know, for instance, if it's fundraising, you're like, I need this fund, these funds. And um, you're just going to keep chasing it, even though somewhere along the way, it's already gone awry, but yes. you, you haven't realized it yet. Um, and it hits you a bit late. And that confusion, that sort of like, you know, mind, body, spirit, not aligned, don't know how to process information, like that kind of got me quite down last year. But it's exactly as you said, when you get through that, you come out with so much more clarity. You learn how to uh, filter better. You learn how to uh, see the the red flags sooner um, and you learn not to chase the wrong things and that you should never really have to chase because when it's the right fit it's a lot like dating when it's the right fit <laughs> you know it's not an uphill battle um, so that was actually a very interesting experience for me because I've never fundraised and I mean I've stood in front of CEOs all my life you know asking for two million euros and five million euros and they usually gave it to me because we had a great plan for the year and stuff but this was different you know I was selling myself selling the company and what we do is so niche that you know what would normally be like two three barriers to to entry suddenly became like five, six, seven barriers to entry because you need to yeah. convince people why this is a great um, business to get into and why they needed to be a part of it. Absolutely. And, you know, I'd love to know just, I mean, you've shared so much in there, you know, already, but just both on the road of entrepreneurship and your journey of change, right? We all have these fears and barriers and, um, you know, it'd be great to hear what some of your biggest fears were um, that you, and, and how you overcame them, right? Something we hear all the time is when people are looking at changing careers is they don't know 100% which direction they want to go into. And so often, you know, we talked about this too, right? It's like that having that certainty of knowing this is the direction that you want to go into um, or when you're young being like, you have to go in this direction for your career for the rest of your life. Sometimes we get that pressure, right? So yeah. I'd love to know what were some of the fears and barriers that came up um, as you move through some of your journey of change. Sure. Um, so it's interesting you used the past tense, right? Like what some of these fears were. I will say, I mean, I still have fears. The fears of change, course. they evolve. Uh, but I'm still fearful of a bunch of things, you know. I, I, and I'm, For instance, when I first started, I guess it was, what if this fails? You know, your ego kicks in and it's you know, when you've always been sort of a good student and then a star employee and then you went off to a great school, there's, there are a lot of expectations on you, like to, to do well again, yes. you know. Um, and you remember earlier I mentioned that I kept the brand, my personal brand and the company separate. It literally took me two years before I did a post on my personal Facebook page about the company. Right. And it felt right. It felt good at the time. I did a post on how, you know, hey, if you guys are wondering which black hole I've disappeared into and why, <laughs> this is why. And I talked about the company. I hit the two-year mark. And I felt that, look, if I hit the two-year mark, we're going to be okay. You know, that was my, my sort of KPI. You know, I hate three-letter yeah. acronyms. But uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, I, to me, that was my indicator that if I had stuck it out for two years, there's something about this that I'm drawn, you know, that I'm drawn into. And I think it's going to be okay. Um, 
And now I'm just like, you know, that fear has sort of subsided, but it's still there because I don't want to let my parents down. For instance, you know, they don't understand what I do. So um, I can't fail in that sense because I want to keep feeding yeah. them good stories. Right. Um, and then you, you don't want to let your classmates down. There's a lot of like pressure, but you have to realize that a lot of it you actually put on yourself. Yes. yourself. Um, and to learn to eradicate that. And, and, and to be okay with admitting your fears and your anxieties. Um, I did a founder coaching program last year. It was really great. Um, right. it's, uh, it's become a different program this year, so I'm not going to talk about it too much. But it was really necessary because after this whole fundraising round, remember I told you I sort of went into a weird yes. place. I, I just wasn't sure what I was doing anymore. And I was like, Am I, should I pivot the company in the direction this investor wanted me to go to, but it doesn't feel right. You know, I had to get rid of my, my, you know, we're a social enterprise and we hire people, intellectual disabilities, and we hire ex offenders. And this investor was happy to support the company if I got rid of all of them. And it's, it's, it's very confusing, you know? Um, so in the end, I, I stumbled upon this founder coaching program and it was really amazing. And one of the things it focused on was the fear and anxiety of being an entrepreneur and how people don't talk about this enough yes. as if we're not allowed to be scared and we're not allowed to be anxious. And very often we need a community of people who feel the fear, feel the anxiety and for us people just talk about it yeah. and we find it that company and person are different. It's okay to change your mind. It's okay to pivot. It's okay to fail and fall flat. You know, there's a reason why the expression serial entrepreneur, you know, exists because sometimes some people need five, six shots before they, they make it. Sometimes they will never make it, but it doesn't mean you can't be an entrepreneur. Like, you know, there's a lot of pressure to be the next unicorn, but hey, everyone talks about those guys, but no one talks about the 99% of startups that don't even make it past two years. Um, so I think it's important to admit your fears and anxieties and be able to talk about them. And I think, you know, this is, again, going back to this idea of surrounding yourself with the right people, yes. your support network. Um, people need to believe in you. They need to share your faith. And they need to basically know that their role in life is not to tell you not to do it, but to be there if you do it and it doesn't work out. Because that's a very, that's like the biggest fear, right? What if it doesn't work out? And everything stems from there. What if I can't find the right people? What if I uh, don't have enough cash? It all comes from that same umbrella fear, which is what if it doesn't work out? How will I deal with this? But if you know you've got a bunch of people who are going to love you and care for you and be there for you, whether or not you fail, I think that's very, very comforting. And I think I have that, but sometimes I forget. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I try and say, I don't tend to have the word fail in my dictionary because I feel that there's a celebritism around entrepreneurship, around failing, all these other things. But actually, you know, I look at failing as it, we make mistakes. We're only human, right? So to me, it's not that I'm failing, I'm learning and I'm growing and it's mistakes that we can move through and overcome, right? Unless so. literally like you, you've like blown a house up or something, you know, I, I just, I feel sometimes there's too much use of that word fail, fail yeah. hard fail fast, you know, fail quick, all these sort of things. And, and really it's more about, these are, these are life's lessons, right? These are lessons that we all go through and that we will learn from, whether it means that we shut one business down now and then start something else or all these other things, right? It's part and parcel of the journey that we go down. And sometimes, you know, shutting down one business and starting another, you're going to learn so much more from there. But like you said, a lot of it is ego. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think, that everyone has that, right? You have your good ego, you have bad ego, um, and everyone needs a little bit of that because it's confidence as well, right? You need to have the confidence and courage to be able to, to make a change and to step forward and, and go forth and know that not everything is forever. And it's okay if it doesn't work out and it's okay if you change your mind or it's okay if you decide to take it in a different direction. And I think, you know, um, that what you're saying is so true. It's like having your cheerleaders, your challengers and your supporters around you so that you can be equipped at the times when you are in your maybe weakest points, yeah. right? Um, or when you need someone to help fulfill your cup a little bit, right? Because we yeah. all need a little bit of cup filling every now and then. We can't do it ourselves. Yeah. But you know, I, I think you touched on a few great things there, you know, like we don't want to say, we don't want to say fail. We, 
we don't want to say make mistake and we want to position all of this as learning. But I have to say when, when you're there and you're in the, in the, in the trenches and things are not going well, it's very, very hard to believe that this is all for your learning. It's oh, really, yeah. really hard. And you will feel like you failed and you will feel like you've made mistakes and you're like, ah, oh, I I could go back and undo that. Um, and that's why I really think it comes back to the people because the people you surround yourself with are the ones that can help you see the light when you don't. And sometimes you just can't when things are going so wrong. And I think you're so right. Yeah, I mean, I think you're so right there. You know, we, we've definitely gone back and forth so many times. I think another thing, though, is mindset. Yeah. Right. And, um, you know, for a while, I kind of went to, through a period where I was not doing, um, you know, I, I wasn't working on my mindset as much because we had gone through a really, 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 really rough patch. Right. And so you're like, am I going, are we going in the right direction? Are we not going in the right direction? But people are saying we should go this way, similar to what you had said. Right. And we, we were going through in a similar process um, a few years back. And I think something that I realized over this last sort of year is shifting our mindsets and still being able to have that. And I know you have some, you know, uh, you're also a yoga teacher, a certified yoga teacher, right? And um, we were talking earlier about how you make some time out for yourself. And I think that is something that a lot of entrepreneurs um, or people moving through change in general also need to make more time for is making time for themselves to just regain themselves and really get themselves in a mindset that, you know, allows them to bring back that positiveness, right? Yeah. It doesn't mean we have to be positive every day, but mindset and reframing our mindset is so important and it's hard to remind ourselves of it. But I do things like put post-its up or, you know, have things as a reminder on my phone where I'll be like, congratulations, congratulations, you know, client just bought your program or whatever it is, right? Little boosters that I know that I'm walking down in the right direction or giving me some positive uh, feedback even if it's an affirmation or whatever it is. No, absolutely. And you know, it's, it's funny you brought this up because this is something I just experienced recently. Um, you know, as, as the head of the company, like, you know, I'm constantly looking at what else we can do, right? How do we grow the business, blah, blah, blah. And I always forget how much we've actually done in such a short period of time. And most recently, um, an investor wrote back, uh, a potential investor wrote back and said, um, tell me how you've gotten this valuation. And I basically had to say, well, when we got our first investor last year, he gave us this much money for this much equity, which was basically the first valuation of the company. And then since then, these are all the things that we have achieved, uh, which is why this is our new valuation. And as I was listing that, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> we've done so much in eight months and you forget, you absolutely forget. And you realize how lucky you are to have the, the team that you have that has pulled that off for you and with you. And I think I want to do that more. I want to write these lists of all the things we've done because if not for, the, if not for that email that I wrote to this um, uh, potential investor, I would not have realized that. And I constantly would have been like, we missed the deadline for this audit. We're supposed to have submitted that. You know, you get so consumed with the things that you haven't done. So that's my new thing. I'm trying so actually, to- There is a creative agency. Um, and uh, I read this when I was going through a breakdown like seven years ago. And what they did was they wrote down every task that they had achieved and um, for the team. And they pasted it up on their wall so over the year, they could start seeing their wall being built up with all of the tasks that they had done. And actually, Sol and I, um, probably back in 2014, um, we used to use Workflowy, and we would list all the tasks. And instead of deleting the tasks, we would strike them out, but we would then be able to look at the end of the year and go, oh my God, look at all <laughs> that we have done, right? I mean, I think that's really important. And, you know, I think... That's something that, like you said, it's, it's having the, you know, again, just looking at what we have achieved, no matter how small, um, and focusing and being, you know, having gratitude around that. Um, you know, and I, I'd love to know, like, I guess you talk about networks, right? And so how did you, um, you know, 
obviously making a shift from uh, corporate or you know studying as well then to running your own business there's a lot of those fears that come up right and sometimes knowing which direction to take it's hard as well but for you it's sort of you just you stumbled across it there was a problem you were wanting to face and it sort of just evolved from there right um, and you felt that it was the right decision so I have, I guess on one hand, it's like, how did you find the right networks or how did you build the right support system? And community is so important. And, you know, I know for myself, it was constantly something that I was building as I was going through my own journey, but also something that I saw was needed for women entrepreneurs or change makers. So how did you build that type of support system? What are the key networks or mentors that you had um, or that you have built along the way and, and sort of how did you get that process going? Um, okay, so you know a lot of people ask me this and I always start by saying I hate the word network and networking, right? Because I feel like when you say that it sounds so agenda driven like you always totally. want something um, and, I, and I think that that's sometimes what makes you very unattractive to a community or to people that you meet um, so I kind of went in to just talk to as many people as I could, you know, the whole sponge thing. Yes. Um, and always made it very clear that I was there to learn and not always just sort of take something back. And yeah. I also went in ready to give because I have, I wear different hats. I'm also a marketing communications consultant. I mean, that's my background. So that's what pays rent while I grow the food company. Um, and, you know, I always gave counsel to people. And you got to you got to give to get as well. And I think very often, we, you know, when we network, we're just yeah. handing out these business cards and we're always just trying to get something out of people. But I think if you just connected to people on an almost social level first and felt the vibe and felt the energy and um, sort of caught up for a coffee later on to see, hey, or, you know, like you'll meet 10 people at an event but you can't network with 10 people. You know, you just come off as that annoying person with the name card sticking into someone's face. Um, um, I just sort of would talk to people. And I guess thing, I hate networking. You know, I'm the kind of person who goes to a party and then I leave after I've met three people and I meet people at the coat hanger or like, you know, at the buffet table where it's totally random. And that's really how I meet people because I don't like agenda driven conversations. And I hate it's so true. Talks. Everyone's like, how, I totally hear you on that side. And it's interesting because, you know, I like to say, it's about building relationships, right? And it's, and it's a give and take and, and something we always get asked with career shifters is like, okay, but I wanna change careers. So how many, you know, how can I build my contacts in this industry, right? And it's very transactional. And every time I get asked this question, it's very much like, oh, but you have a really big network. But actually for me, it was, it was about, I, I don't like networking, I, even though I'm extroverted, I probably am like you where I go in and I'll maybe meet a couple of people yeah. and I build really good relationships with them, right? Um, and that's actually why I started building communities was because I found that there's so much of the networking that was very transactional versus like building experiences and relationships and, you know, authentic relationships and con yeah. connecting on aligned values or, you know, aligned sort of visions on certain things and, and building from there and then it's a it's a process from on its own from where you take it or how you take it and move it forward. I completely agree and I think that you know it's about putting yourself out there and letting people know who you are and what you do and not what you want and what you need you know um, because people eventually it's building a profile right but on in a social context first so people know who you are you develop some form of top of mind recall like I think for the for the longest time I was the cake lady you know <laughs> in all my different communities and people would expect me to just have cake in my bag and I'm like that's not how it works I don't <laughs> <have a> cake. <laughs> you know um but people just knew who I was and what I did and eventually you know within different communities I mean I have a very very strong business school community and I you know I cannot underestimate the value of that it is a tight-knit community and you know it, it, people are always willing to help and that's fantastic but you find your own community somewhere you know um and but I think that you know it's never about the one who's always asking or taking. It's very often people remember you for giving. Um, and I think you, you, it's important to give, you know, and, um, and give first or ask for nothing and yeah. just let people know who you are. Um, but you're right about the communities. You know, many, many years ago, I think it must have been some sort of quarter life crisis. I decided I was going to learn how to play the trumpet. <laughs> um, and one of the best pieces of advice my friend gave to me was, find a community. 
I did not understand it then, but I understand it now. I think, you know, again, we were talked about self-discovery through entrepreneurship. And I think I understand this concept of community very, very differently. You know, I've always not really related to my ethnic group or my religion. I don't really have one. I've not, um, I, you know, I don't have a super strong family. So I've never really felt this, like I belong to one community. Um, but now I get it. You know, I, I feel like I belong to a community of entrepreneurs or people or freelancers or, you know, that sort of group where, we get the same struggle, the yeah. same journey, the yeah. same pain points. And it's really important because then you don't feel alone. And very often in my worst burnouts, it's that sense of isolation um, that I think is what fuels the burnout because you feel like there's no way out. There's no one to talk to about it. No one understands you. So that community is very, very, very important. And I think that's why that founder coaching program was so great because it was like 30 of us, I think, or 20 of us. We were all online. It was a Skype-based coaching program, but we all got one another. <laughs> you know, it was, across, I think, eight countries. Um, but you just feel like people understand. And I think like any experience in life, being a new mom, um, getting a new job, like any experience in life, you just want to make sure people understand you. And entrepreneurship is no different. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, so often founders get um, burnout. Uh, I mean, also people in, in, in traditional careers. Right. Um, and I, I think founders also get founder fatigue because you're so often trying to like build your business, grow your business. Yes. And, you know, you're, you're up all night. It's like you're, it, it, it's your baby. Right. Um, and, and your mind is going and obviously depending on what type of a person you are as well, you know, um, some people are more anxious than others. Others are more, you know, uh, more worried or stressed around other parts. And there's so many changing things every day um, to manage. Right. So I think you know, I want to sort of um, ask two more things. Well, you know, I want to share, I'd love for you to share three tips, but before I, you know, if you had to um, redo it or if you could do it all <laughs> again, right, how would you do it differently or would you not do it differently? And you talked about these assets that you have and these transferable skills. And, you know, I think that's so important for everyone that's watching because as career shifters, we often forget um, that a lot of the skills that we have are transferable from one, one industry to another or from one you know, job to even starting your own business. Um, and it's just sometimes we don't know, we're not listing it out, right? Until yeah. you have to start doing things or until maybe you look at a job description. And, you know, is there anything that you would do differently? And, you know, if so, how would you do it differently? You know, that's a, that's a very interesting question because no one's asked me that. And now that I have to think about it, I'm thinking... I don't actually have an answer for this simply because I didn't plan this. Yeah. You know, so it's not like I can go back a few steps and say, ah, oh, this part of the plan I would change. You know, I, I can't do that because I fell into this. And so often I have people telling me things like, oh, you're really living the dream. I'm like, no, because I never dreamt of this. <laughs> you know, like, I never planned this. So, what would well, I that's great. That's really good too, because I know we have a lot of people in our audience and I know in our last session last week, someone said, but I struggle with like the five-year plan, right? Or like envisioning where you want to be in five years. And so I think that, you know, some people have that in their vision, right? It's like, I want to do this. I want to become X uh, and, you know, whatever problem it is that they find, they end up solving, but it's got their bigger vision in there. And for me, I have a very set idea of the vision of, of who I want to be or what I want to do, even though the journey can change, right? And yeah. I think that's something with yourself too. Maybe the vision wasn't necessarily like, I want to be running my own business and doing X, Y, Z, but, you know, um, whether it's having a vision of making an impact, right, in the world in some shape or form. And I think that's something we are talking about where, um, you know, it's like knowing that it's not the direction, but it's more the, the journey, right? So the destination, uh, it's the journey versus the destination. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what keeps me going is the sense of fulfillment, Um like I do really enjoy the work uh, uh, and I mean, it's still work and it's hard work. And if you don't enjoy it and you're not feeling fulfilled, it's not for you. <laughs> and on a bad day, I'm like, why am I doing this? Um, I, I guess in some sense, I have some sort of direction or, or 
even destination sounds really fixed. And we established at the start of this chat that I don't like having a fixed destination. Um, but I think I know what makes me happy and what doesn't. And I think being in a cold gray office every single day, working for a very large corporation or rich corporation and making it richer was not for me. So in that sense, I had a, a direction away from something. And oh my goodness, very accidentally gave me a direction towards something. Um, and I mean, I, I, in the end, I just, I just know I want to have a very sort of chill life. I, I know I, I, you know, before I even went off to business school, I knew that I wanted what was the buzzword back then, portfolio career. <laughs> and I always told myself when I'm 45, you know, that's what I want. I am nowhere near 45, thank God. Um, <laughs> no offense to 45 year olds. <laughs> um, and it sort of accidentally happened, right? I'm a marketing communications consultant. I have a food business. Um, I mentor people. I'm an entrepreneur in residence at my business school. Um, you know, I have all these different things and it all happened by accident. But I guess, you know, it's like you get what you give or you, you, you know, you put yourself out there and, and, and it's like laws of attraction, right? People and socialized in a professional context still, um, you know, people sort of knew what I was looking for, knew what I was interested in. And so when these things came about, you know, they would reach out to me. And so I would have these opportunities coming towards me, but I never started a conversation. You know, we talked about this networking thing earlier. I never started a conversation going, I want this opportunity, you know? Um, so it also just fell into place because I think in my communication with people, I had communicated a sense of what sort of life I wanted. And that's more journey than destination. And I think that, if you, if you it, it's okay to have a destination, I think. I mean, I would love a house in the Mediterranean at some point. That's <laughs> um, and, uh, but how you get there, you know, if you're too rigid about that, then you're kind of setting yourself up for disappointment. And I've been there, you know, I was like, I want to make director before I'm 30 and I'm going to have my first secondment overseas by the time I'm 32, you know, that sort of thing. And then when it doesn't happen, you're just like, oh, I failed <laughs> or like it didn't work yeah, out when yeah. actually something else worked out, you know? Yes, um, exactly. And so I guess, you know, it's all it's so true. And, and I love that you talk about the journey versus the destination. You know, something we always hear with our students is that it's a process, right? And often they come into our course being like, I want to do X. But as they go through it, they come through and they're like, wow, we really should just trust the process, right? Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear, you know, before we wrap out, what are your three tips um, for people who are looking to make the shift um, from corporate to social entrepreneurship or just shifting in general, um, you know, starting their own startup. But what would be like the three tips that you would have liked to have heard um, that you think would add value to our audience that's watching us? Okay. I guess the first one, and I think we touched on all of them, but I guess this is a nice summary. Um, the first one would be, you know, it's okay to trial and error. Um, because we don't have all the answers all the time. And if we expect ourselves to have all the answers, especially when you're shifting into something new, you're kind of just setting yourself up for, for misery, you know? So it's okay to try and, and make mistakes or fail, depending on which word you like better. Um, and what I often tell to like my mentees is that it's okay to change your mind. You know, it's really, yeah. really okay. I was on a panel recently and one of my fellow panelists basically said something about how, oh, you know, when you get into entrepreneurship, you really need to know what you're doing because can you imagine if you failed and you changed your mind, you have to tell all your friends and family. I was like, horrified. It's like, why are you on this panel? Um, and, you know, I basically had to counter that because I think that's the kind of fear, especially yes. in Singapore, for instance, you know, our, our, our education system, our, our society um, grooms us to not, allow ourselves to fail you know you need to zoom through your education system you don't take a gap year you need to get your job as soon as possible um you don't get to explore i mean it's changing for sure and i'm so grateful you know we often forget how young a society we are but this whole idea that it's okay to just change your mind you know because yeah. you don't know until you've tried and sometimes you've tried it and it's just not for you you know entrepreneurship is not for everyone and not yeah. just that even the things you do in your business like i'm in the process of making a huge decision decision to close down one part of the business um and you got to strip the ego and emotion out of it because the numbers will speak for themselves you know um and it's a difficult decision but i tried it's just not working out. I'm going to change my mind. Yeah, <laughs> you know? totally. Um, 
so yeah, so trial and error, change your mind, it's all okay. Um, the second thing I would say is, you know, and I think we talked about this quite a bit, um, is surround yourself with the right people. And the right people fall into two categories. One, the people who are on that journey with you, they believe you and they support you almost blindly um, because they're going to be all sorts of naysayers. You know, everyone's going to think you're crazy. Everyone's going to think you're taking too much of a risk. Everyone's going to tell you, and I still get this, Ramya, why don't you just go and get a proper job? <laughs> Like, this is a job. <laughs> I kill myself with this company. It is a job. Um, and you need to surround yourself with people who will believe and who will support you. Having said that, that leads me to my second category, which is you need to have checks and balances as well. It is not super healthy to only have people who are cheering you on because you need sometimes to have that good friend who's going to call you out and like, hey, you know, you might want to get your finances back in order or, hey, um, you might want to do this a little different. You've neglected this and that or someone to basically say, hey, your health, your health is falling apart. You know, do something about that. So you need that two group, those two groups, checks and balances and people who are just believing in you and cheering you on because you will need it. Um, and, and related to that, cancelling out the noise, knowing what's noise and, and cancelling that out and staying focused um, because it's very easy to get distracted um, and, and, you know, by different people saying different things because everyone's going to teach you how to run your business. Everyone, <laughs> everybody, even people who have never run a business <laughs> in their lives ever. And the last thing, and we talked about this as well, is, um, you know, journey versus destination, you know, and it applies to your personal life, I suppose, but it also applies to the business. And I find this to be the hardest with business um, yeah. because you are, especially when you start having staff and when you start having investors, because you're no longer accountable to just yourself. And this for me, I think, especially having staff has been the greatest source of anxiety because you know, you're no, it's not about you anymore. Um, yeah. you know, you're, you've hired people and sometimes these are people who live paycheck to paycheck and you're responsible for them. You have to not screw them over, <laughs> you know. Um, but having said that, you know, just focus on that, that journey um, because you will make poor decisions if you're focused on a certain goal. You know, um, yes. a very common phenomenon with entrepreneurs is underestimating yes. how long things take. Yeah, it absolutely. Always takes uh, three times. I, I was on a, on a panel for a startup com competition recently and I was like, oh, it always takes a lot longer. And the person next to me said, three times as long. <laughs> <laughs> if you plan for six months, make it 18. And you know what? We're launching a new product now. It's been in the making since last October. And I was all set to launch it in January. This, <laughs> I'm like, hmm, it's almost January next year and we're still not done. Things always take longer. And if you're so focused on that destination, yeah. Um, that, that achievement, that checking of the box, um, you're just going to drive yourself crazy. And I catch myself doing that sometimes. And I need to remind myself that, look, if this product is going to be launched six months later, but it's going to be launched well, and it's going to be launched right, with the right amount of resources behind it, then we're just going to delay it by six months. This is a conversation I had with myself just last week. So it's not it's like, true. you know. We all need these reminders, right? I think <laughs> yeah. the thing is like these things that we're saying or that you share are just also things that we constantly need to be putting to ourselves because when you're in the dirt of it all and you're so caught up into your everyday thing, you do forget about these things, right? And I know I used to remind myself with, again, Post-its because I'm a huge Post-it user where I'd have certain things that just keep me you know, staying focused on the bigger sort of picture versus like the exact thing that I'm needing. And if I don't launch it straight away, or if we need to launch it earlier to test it, it's okay. Everything doesn't need to be perfect, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes the whole idea of just shipping things and moving fast versus waiting for that perfect time. But again, it's very different industry to industry. Um, and when you're dealing with food and health, health regulations, all of those things, there are a lot more variables that you need to think about versus, you know, just getting a, a product out there, right? Yeah, which links back to point number two, right? Surround yourself with the right people, you know, yes. surround yourself with better people, smarter people, experienced people, wise people, because they're the ones that will remind you sometimes when you forget, like, it's okay, it's okay if it's not launched now. <laughs> Give it some time and do it right. Because you do tend to forget when you're so caught up with like the 15 different 
things that are part of your business plan for 2018, you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, it's all connected. I love it. I love it. And I, I mean, we're, I've taken some notes and we're going to share those comments. Um, we're going to share those tips in the comments as well. Um, and, you know, for everyone that has been watching, we really appreciate you guys tuning in live for tonight. And, um, you know, Ramya, I just want to say thank you so much for your time and for sharing your um, key tips, but your story and just how you've kind of moved from you know, your early career lives to doing your MBA to now launching, oh my goodness, um, and just wearing all, all the different hats that you do. And I think um, as you shared, you know, it, it's that sense of fulfillment and it really does radiate in everything that you've talked um, about tonight, as well as, you know, that, that journey and that that passion and purpose that you have in, in what it is that you're doing. Um, so I just want to say a big thank you to you, Ramya. And um, before we go, I want to also um, just see how can people find you? Uh, we're going to share it in our social media channels as well as in our newsletters for those of you that are on our database. Um, and of course, you know, if you want to watch the, the um, video again, you can after tonight's session, it will be there. I'm not sure um, I want to see myself on camera. <laughs> I keep staring at the little screen here and I'm like, okay, hmm, change angle. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it unedited, raw, of course. Oh, no. um, and, uh, and those of you that end up watching this, you know, in the replay, feel free to add your comments in there afterwards. Um, hey, Elisa and um, Daryl, I don't know who else is watching because I know there's the numbers sort of ticking, but I can't see the others. Um, so whoever else is watching out there, sorry, I'm not shouting out your names, um, but appreciate you guys watching us on this Monday um, evening. And hopefully, you know, tonight's story um, that and, and Ramya's own journey has really shared a little bit more on insight on how you can take things forward, um, whether it's launching your own social enterprise, your own startup, or um, shifting in careers or life in some shape or form. Um, so again, Ramya, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you guys watching. Um, but where can we find you? I think the best place to find me would probably be LinkedIn. Okay. Um, cause you know, you'd get me directly. I'm pretty good at replying to messages and you can sort of see my very colorful trajectory as well. And mind you, that's just the stuff that I put out there. <laughs> <laughs> All these other things. Okay. Um, yeah. I can share the LinkedIn link on, on, um, our Facebook comments, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, perfect. So I'll share that. Um, and yes, and thank you. Always inspiring. Thanks, Daryl. So good to hear. Um, and uh, Ramya, if you want, you can go back and, and check out some of the comments um, on our Facebook. You don't have to watch the whole video. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we'll share your links and of course um, your channels to Oh My Goodness um, on Instagram as well, hopefully, and Facebook. Is that right? Yeah. And the website. Okay, perfect. So we'll share that all in the comments. And yeah, again, big thanks, guys. We'll see you next week for our Monday Mojo and Reset. Um, and for those of you that are looking for a career change, if you're interested, we do have our Confidently Create Your Bold Career Move course, um, which is a, a live, we have a live and a self-paced version. Um, so you can find out more at bit.ly forward slash bold career, but we'll share more as you, as you, as you, um, know over the weeks and, um, stay posted on our Facebook page or on our newsletter. And again, have an awesome evening guys. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye.